Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. you today? Good. Well, if you're joining us online, welcome. We're glad to have you. We are uh, in this Advent series. We just started last week. That Advent means we're kind of looking towards uh, Christmas and the coming of Jesus as they were uh, 2,000 years ago. People were anticipating uh, uh, Jesus coming. And so we kind of anticipate Christmas and what Christ is going to do in our lives and, uh, and uh, kind of take those four weeks going into it and and, and think about the significance of Christmas. And, and as we do that, we're looking at each of the key characters in the Bible story. Before I get into that, though, what I want to do is just mention to you that we have a, a significant uh, conference coming up this coming year. And I know that sounds like it's a long way away, but it's, it's it, here it is. Uh, whoops, it'll move in a second. Uh, it's called uh, Max Influence. And it's this uh, summer, at the very last day of June, June 30th, and then the first day of July, July 1st, over those two days, it's a Tuesday and Wednesday, and we, I'm telling you, when you take uh, some time, I know we usually take vacation time and look and think about R&R, but my, what, we only do this every other year, but what I'm going to suggest you do is take two days off from work and use it to invest in your soul. Invest in your spirit and watch what God does when you do that. I mean, we have world-class speakers that we uh, have, we actually got them signed up a year ago. Their, their, their schedule's so tight, they're, they're, they're in demand all over the world. And, uh, and so we're just, we're just super glad to have them. Uh, but not only that, if you have kids, we have an incredible kids ministry. I mean, this is Way beyond VBS. If you've done v this is VBS on steroids. I mean, we we I mean we, we we just really do some amazing stuff with the kids and with the youth, and uh, it's just going to be terrific. We have so many. We have an after hours party after the first night uh, out here on the parking lot. We're going to have games and a band and all kinds of incredible. It's going to be phenomenal. So you'll want to be part of that. So the reason I, now I'll tell you more as it gets closer in January, we have some brochures I'm going to pass out, but I wanted to let you know now because some of you, you need to kind of reserve that time uh, in, in 2019 for times in 2020, maybe with your work or I know a lot of times when people plan vacations, <clears throat> it, January 1st, uh, reservations open up, you can do Airbnbs wherever you go. And so I wanted to get in first and let you know, you don't want to miss this. You want to be part of what we're doing uh, on July. I think, well, I don't have the dates here, but you, it's in, it's, it, like I said, it's, it's June 30th, July 1st. Write those down. That's very important. So you want to be part of that. Okay, so back to our series that we're in, Advent. Advent, four weeks right before Christmas. We're in week two, and last week we looked at Mary, and what we're finding is, is that these key, these key central characters in the Bible story have to answer an important question. Each one of them are confronted with a question about what will I do? How will I respond? And it defines their destiny, what they're going to do with the rest of their life. Now, we're looking today... At, jo at Joseph, he's the a key figure, kind of like you know you know about Jesus. These are the Jesus's parents, Mary, and now Joseph plays a, a vital role. And then next week we'll look at the shepherds, we'll look at the magi, and then even the last week, uh, which is uh, 
the uh, Christmas Eve, our Christmas Eve services will be 4.30 and 6. So that's, that's Christmas Eve. We do candlelight, Christmas caroling, and then I'll just wrap up our series there. But today we're going to be looking at Joseph, and Joseph, he um, has his own challenges that he has to work through in order to uh, answer this key question, will I obey God even when it doesn't make sense? I mean, so those are like two, two, two parts of that question. One is, is, will I even obey? Will I even do what I'm supposed to do? Second thing is, is, what about when I don't even understand it? When it doesn't even make sense? When it's like counter to what I would anticipate or what I would expect? And this is exactly what's facing Joseph. He's in that difficult place. Now, choosing the word obey in my message title I wasn't so sure I should do that. You know, because obey has kind of like negative connotations. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, obey, what's up with that, right? If you Google obey, you know, it comes up like dog training. And I've done a lot of weddings. I've yet to have somebody say, you know, I'd really like you to say, have that word obey put back in, you know. I will obey, you know. I mean, obey is kind of like, who wants, you know, what's, you know. So I was thinking, well, but that is part of it. You know, the problem is it's our our view of what obey means. Now, now it, it can mean, you know, it can mean a lot of different things. For example, I'm teaching, I, 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 we have a dog that's about a year and a half old, a little puppy. Uh, it's a golden doodle, so that's half golden retriever, half poodle. So it's kind of a designer dog, you know. It's, it can be awkward. I'm at a, sometimes when I go to a, like a pet, uh, one of these uh, dog parks, everybody's bragging that theirs is like a rescue animal. Well, mine's a rescue animal. Well, so is mine. I look, you know, I just, I'm telling you, mine's not. It's a, it's a designer dog. Uh, I, you know, that's just the way that thing ha- happens, okay? So anyways, so I'm, I decided, I've had dogs before, and I, I was never able to teach my dog to bark. And I thought, you know, that'd be a cool trick party trick, you know, (laughs) I don't know, I just, so I thought, I'm going to teach my dog to to bark, and and it's been difficult, because, you know, that's not, dogs don't just usually do that, right, so I had to, so I YouTubed it, and the YouTube guy said, okay, this is what you need to do, you need to be real animated when you're teaching, real excited for your dog, and then use treats, (laughs) that, and high value treats, so I thought, okay, I'm I'm, I'm, cu- I'm coming out with the good stuff for this, this trick. So, I, you know, little pieces of chicken, you know. And, and so I've been trying to teach my dog this, this to speak, to bark. And this past week, just this past week, I had a breakthrough. He actually started, she, it's her, she, her name's Bella. She actually started to respond. So I went ahead and, and snapped it. Now, some of you don't follow me, and that's, that's, that's your problem if you don't follow me on Snap. <laughs> Or Twitter, but just in case you're wondering, at Andy Mead, you know. That's, but so anyways, I, I wanted you to see that. So watch, here it is, my breakthrough moment this week with Bella as she's starting to learn to speak. Watch. All right, Bella. Bella, speak. Speak. Good girl. Let's do it again, Bella. Ready? Bella, Speak. 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 Good girl. One more time. Bella, speak. 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 <laughs> speak. Louder. Speak. <laughs> okay, well, that's it. So I'm teaching her to obey. But see, in, in, in Bella's mind, it's not like this harsh thing. She embraces it. You know, like, so obedience really really comes down to our perspective. Like for some of you, you were raised in a home where obedience, just, you know, your caregiver, you have real negative connotations with, it's just like, uh, you know, willful compliance or unwillful compliance. You do it, but you don't really want to do it. But you're kind of forced to do it because of somebody who's in a position of power over you. Or for some people, it's more like, you know, fearful submission. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to do it, but inside, I don't, I don't want to do it. But I fear you, and I fear what you're going to do. And listen, this is not what 
the Bible te- teaches. In fact, did you know the number one command that the Bible teaches? It's, it's, it's in there more than any other thing that God asks us to do. It's fear not. 365, one for every day of the year, I guess. But 365 times it says fear not. God's saying, hey, I don't want you to, to, to do things out of fear. No, here's, here's the key for obedience, okay? Obedience is love plus trust plus action. Love plus trust plus action. It's in that context is where the biblical concept of obedience comes out. This is what Joseph was doing. This is what we can learn from Joseph, how we can, we can respond to God. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. You will obey what I command. Now, listen, the emphasis is really important here. Because we love him, we obey. Because we love him. You see, it's not, it's not, it's not the opposite. Like, if you do all of these things, if you obey all of these rules, that proves you love me. No, it's because we love him, we respond. It's all about the emphasis on that. And so we're going to look at uh, what what Joseph did. Here's another great quote. This is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was martyred uh, by the Nazis at the very end of the war uh, because of his faith. But here's what he said. He was a pastor. He said, one act of obedience is better than 100 sermons. I've given 100 sermons, and I can tell you this is true. It, It is more important that we do one act of obedience than just listen to 100 sermons or give 100 sermons for that matter. It is, it is vital that we say, hey, I want to be in a relationship with God where I learn to, to do what God wants me to do. It's not okay to just listen and listen and listen, read and read and read and never do what any, what, you know, it's just, it doesn't help me. It doesn't help anybody else. So what we learned from Joseph, his first thing is, is he responded quickly. Do it now without hesitancy. You learn what God wants you to do. You respond right away. Now, notice with me. What he says, it says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, in other words, he was a righteous person, and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly, talking about Mary. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will, be, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he, was, he will save his people from their sins. So Joseph here, he discovers that his fiancée is pregnant, not by him, and he's thinking, I'm going to divorce her. I'm going to get rid of her. An engagement in those days was very, you know, was more a betrothal was was probably more binding than our engagements are today, but still not married. So he decides, I'm, getting, I'm done with this. I'm done with this. And then God speaks to him and says, no, actually, I'm involved in this. I'm part of this. And, and, and so that's all he needs is he gets that instruction from God through an angel, and he realizes, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond differently because of this. And, and he does it right away. He, he just changes his mind. When, jo- when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He just did it right there and right then and took Mary home as his wife. That wasn't easy, right? That wasn't his expectation that things were going to go down that way. He was hoping they would be different. You know, I mean, here he is. He's, it's his wife, and it's, it's, it, it looks a lot different than what he had expected. And so the same thing with Mary, of course. The Bible says, I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. It's always better to do what God says right away. Let me give you an example. Let's say at work, you say something that's just very, not very nice about somebody. You know, I mean, we all fall into that stuff, right? You say something, it's just outright mean or nasty. And, you, and then later on during the day, uh, you have this little, this conscience, this voice, you know, maybe it's not audible, but it's just kind of like, there's a whisper and says, you need to go and apologize. That wasn't right. And so you think to yourself, okay, I'll do that before the end of the day. And then you walk by their office or their cubicle or what their workspace late, you know, during the day. And you think, I'll just do it tomorrow. Now, let me ask you a question. 
Is it easier when it, tomorrow comes? No, right? It's actually harder. And then you do tomorrow, I'll do it the next day. I mean, this, it's better just to do it right then and right there. In my experience, it's better just to do it right when that voice happens. And just say, you know what, I'm going to just take care of business right now. I'm not going to let that thing fester. I don't want to have to, it's sucking the emotional energy out of me. The first available moment, I'm going to go try to take care of that. And so it's better to do it now. Do it right now. That's certainly one thing we learned from Joseph. Another thing is just to keep on trusting. You keep on trusting. You know, there's some people that they, that they respond quickly, but then they, their follow through is terrible. There's other people that, they're faithful, but they just procrastinate. I mean, when they finally get around to it, they, they, they get on the program. But here, Joseph, he did both. He was able to intersect both. He did it right away. He recognized, hey, I need to be on this. And then secondly, is, is he, stayed, he stayed in the game. It says, they refrained from having sex until she gave birth to her son, whom they named Jesus. So they... They refrained from having sex. That's, that probably is not what he, his dream honeymoon, right? Hey, we're going to go on a honeymoon. And, and then, no, there's no sex involved in this. It's not what I, it's not, I mean, that's not probably his, his, his best, right? But he does what, that's, that was, would have been his plan. But God had a different plan. And so he refrained. He said, oh, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have sex. You know, sometimes... There's things that we want, things our bodies desire, and God says, this is a season where you refrain from that. I mean, maybe you're single and you're dating, and you go, to, go out on a date, and maybe a couple dates, or and, and you discover on one of these dates that the person you're dating, they have intentions on having sex that night, or, you know, having sex that day, or whatever. And inside you're thinking, oh, I'm not, I, don't, I don't necessarily want that, I don't know if that's and then there's a little conscience, a, vo a voice, the Holy Spirit starts speaking in you and says, that's not God's best for you. That's not how you glorify God with your body. But then you can override that and you can say, oh, yeah, but I'm so lonely. Oh, but I deserve to be loved. Oh, God's so forgiving. I mean, we have all ways of just kind of like overriding what we, but what Joseph teaches us is that, no, you, I, I want to have a good follow through. And sometimes we go through seasons when we don't, when we have to refrain. You know, there's a lot of young people that get married and the guy, he's in his mind, when they get married, they're going to be having sex like three times a day. And usually it's not that way. And so, you know, then there's the, all of a sudden, oh no, I, I thought it was like, you know, this crazy sex fest when we got married. And now I don't have that. And so for that young guy, I mean, that's, that's, there's some refraining there that goes on. You know, whether you're single or whether you're married, sometimes you have to refrain from having sex. I mean, you just go through those seasons for different reasons. That happened uh, an extended time in our marriage. When Sharon and I had a hard time having kids. And so when we finally ha had our first child, the one that actually lived was, was, uh, was still very, very traumatic. By the time uh, that was Samuel, or, or, or one that we have today, he, we, uh, at 18 weeks, we went and had uh, an ultrasound. They said, oh, this child's going to die like the other ones. Uh, it's going to, you know, and, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be probably stillborn, and they had all these uh, things associated with it. And we decided, well, we're going to believe for, for healing. They said, well, if you do that, that's fine, but here's what's going to happen. And, and, and one of the things that happened was his lungs weren't developing properly. And when you're in utero, a lot of the amniotic fluid that's constantly being produced by the mother is actually consumed by the baby. Most of, the, most of their baby weight and that's how they get their oxygen, all those things happen through the amniotic fluid. Well, he wasn't drinking that because, or very little because he, he, he couldn't. He couldn't swallow his esophagus was, uh, was being blocked by, by all these problems going on. And so they said, well, okay, well, they assigned Sharon to bed rest. She, I mean, can't do anything, can't go shopping, can't get up, I mean, bed rest. And he said, and you can't have sex. That didn't go down too well. I didn't like that plan. But that was the plan. 
And it, that was part of, I mean, God didn't heal him right away. God did end up healing him at the very end. But listen, a pregnancy is 40 weeks long. That's a long time from 18 to 40. And I was counting the days. Sometimes, sometimes the, God's plan for us, sometimes the season of life we're in, we need to refrain from things. Now, we're talking about sex today, but, you know, there's other things that sometimes you have to refrain from. Sometimes you don't get all of your needs met. And sometimes, sometimes it's a volitional thing we do. That's what, what, what we call fasting. Fasting is primarily food given. That's true. But the goal of fasting is, is that I, the, my body desperately wants something. I'm going to deny it of that and use that as an opportunity to focus in on God. That's why it's always with prayer and fasting. And we encourage. Now, in, in our church, we do something together, 21 days of prayer and fasting. And it's, here it is, it's from January 5th. 5th to the 25th, and that, that's this coming year. And what we encourage you to do is choose something that you, is part of your life, is maybe even a little too much part of your life, and if you were to give that up, it would create a little more space for you to seek God and for God to, see, to, to, God to speak into your life. And so you can be thinking about that. And we do it right out of January because, you know, December is such, you know, there's festivities and food and all kinds of stuff. And so it's a, good, it's a good way to start out our year and go to God. But that's the point of that. And that's kind of what's, what happens when we refrain and we say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put God first in this place and, and, and let God do something in my life. Look at this verse. It says, the Lord himself, this is out of the Old Testament. This is something that Joseph would have known. Because if you noticed in, in, in the reading there, nowhere did the angel actually say, oh, by the way, you can't have sex. So how did he come up with that? Well, here it is. He knew this verse. The Lord himself will choose this, a sign. A child shall be born to a what? Virgin. Yeah. And she will call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. So when, they, when Joseph discovered what was going down, he was going, oh, you're going to be that woman, the virgin. Oh, I see how that works. That means that I play an important part to make that prophecy happen. Because you are carrying the Son of God. And so, he, so in hearing from God, we hear God, you know, he, Joseph was hearing God through an angel. But today, you know, when we invite God's Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Sometimes audibly, usually not, at least in my experience. Most often it's this still small voice, it's my conscience. But I, it's undeniably the Holy Spirit speaking, showing me something in different ways. And God speaks to us. But another way that God speaks to us just as valid is through his word. Just like for Joseph, he knew God's word so he could respond to that. That's why it's part of our direction comes from going to God and discovering his word. Okay, then let it go. So this is another part of what Joseph needed to learn. Was this, if he was going to fulfill his destiny, his calling, was to let it go. And it says, when they had gone, this, that's the magi, the, the wise men, uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. So this is, happens in a dream. In my mind, I see the angel coming up and whispering, get up, you know, you gotta go. You know, it's in, it's in the middle of the night. Uh, Herod's castle a Herodium, it actually overlooks Bethlehem. He actually, him and his guards, they could have seen right into Bethlehem and they're on to him. So he escapes at night. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed there until the death of Herod. So here they flee in the middle of the night, the sense of urgency, but he, I mean, he's leaving his, all the things that he's, been comfortable with. And this is now becoming part of what they do because, I mean, with the in, in, engagement was difficult. And when uh, uh, Mary was, was pregnant and ready to deliver, she had to either walk or be on a donkey and go all the way from Nazareth down to Bethlehem because of that census. That doesn't sound like too much fun. And then when the baby was born, 
They didn't have a, a proper room for him. He's in with animals in a, in a stable. I mean, even in the third world country, that's, 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 that's very unsanitary, and he's born there. So, I mean, he's starting to, he, he's figuring this out. He's going, okay, now we're off to Egypt. And the Egypt, he doesn't know the language. He doesn't know the culture. He's taking this baby. He doesn't have the resources. He's kind of running. But he lets it go. Sometimes we have to let things go, things that are comfort zone. This is what makes me comfortable. This is my surroundings. I feel comfortable here because God is going to do something in and through us. It's part of him fulfilling his destiny in us. And so letting, listen, here's the thing. When you're comfortable, you're probably not growing a lot. And God wants you to grow. When I stay comfortable, I'm not going to grow. Part of growing, part of saying, I want 2020 to be different than 2019. I want this coming decade to be different than the last decade. Well, you know what that means? You're probably going to be uncomfortable. If you're serious about it, if you're saying, I really want to grow, I really want to step into what God has for me, then you got to be willing to let some things go. Things that are getting in your way, things that are holding you back, things that are safe for you. One of the things that you need if you're going to grow as a Christ follower is you need a community of support. You need people that are there to pray for you, to encourage you, to lift you up. But listen, that is not easy to get. It's way safer and more comfortable to stay at home, watch your shows alone, or do whatever you do at home at alone, than it is to get in your car and drive to somebody else's home in a small group and meet with other people and develop new friends. That is way more uncomfortable. It's a little scary, actually. But if you're going to grow, you need to step out of your comfort zone. And you need to be part of a small group. That is part of God always, a Lone Ranger Christian, you do not see this in the Bible. Really, a Lone Ranger Christian is just an orphan. God calls us into community. And so that's a big part of why we do small groups. The Bible says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Our comfort ultimately comes not from food. I know comfort food. That's why it tastes good, right? And it brings us comfort. And there's people that we try to rely on that give us comfort. And people do. Food can give us comfort and people can give us comfort. But our primary source of comfort should be looking to God, especially when we are in an uncomfortable place, especially when we're stepping into what God has for us because we want to grow and we say, God, you bring me comfort. You bring me comfort. Number four, take a risk. You got to be willing to risk take. If you're going to achieve what God has for you and step into your destiny, you got to be willing to take a risk. Certainly, Joseph does that. It says, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, because, I mean, they don't have uh, telephones and internet back then. So an angel comes to him and says, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the life of the child's uh, life are dead. That was, that's Herod, Herod the Great. He was, he was a murderer. He murdered lots of people. And, uh, and, and, he was after, and he was after Jesus. And trying to kill him. And so now the angel says he's dead. But listen, if he gets it wrong, there's a risk take. He's thinking, well, what if I heard God wrong? What if I misunderstood the angel? I mean, there's risk taking, you know, going back into this, you know, hostile land that he left. But he leaves that in order to go and try something different. And, and whenever you're doing something for God, there's fear associated with it. In fact, you know, there's a lot of fear in life in general. Most of us have big fears. And little fears, if we're honest, big fears, what's my future going to be like, you know, whether it's retirement or we'll end up in a nursing home. What kind of, I mean, fears about our health, fears about our finances. I mean, there's fears, with, you know, there's some big fears, relationships. Then there's little fears, smaller fears that we deal with. You know, will I be approved? Will I be accepted? Should I make that phone call? And all those kinds of things. But part of following God is, is to Go into that fear. Like I said earlier, God says, fear not. We can rely on God. God's going to be there with us. And we can go into life and with boldness. Even when I am afraid, I keep trusting in you. And so we just, sit. That's a, that's a, when we face fears, we go to God and say, God, I'm going to trust you. You're going to get me through this. There's three types of risks. When you're taking risks, 
There's some that I would not suggest. Some are just like, they're crazy. Like if you were to say, you know, Andy, I'm going to, you know, liquidate all of my assets. I'm going to fly to Vegas, put all of that money on the number seven, because that's God's number, you know. And uh, and then I'm just going to, and then, and I have all these plans because it's going to happen, and I'm going to give money to the poor, and I'm going to do this. And, well, that's, that's, that's stupid, you know. It's crazy, right? That's, I, and some people, they, they live for that kind of stuff. That's really more of just an adrenaline rush. They're just, their life is stagnant. And, uh, and listen, if you're living for God, there's plenty of adrenaline. There's plenty of excitement. God calls us to do some amazing things, some great adventures. But some people, they get stuck, and so they try crazy risks. And then there's calculated risks, staying in the financial uh, domain. A calculated risk would be, hey, I'm going to take some of my money and put it in a mutual fund, and I have this strategic plan for my investments. I mean, certainly there's calculated risks, and then there's Christ-like risks. Christ-like risks often are ones that don't make a whole lot of sense. They're not crazy, but they're not normal. They're not what you see in the world. And so it's a Christ-like risk. Hey, I'm going to give sacrificially to this, you know, to this work that I believe is going to change people's destiny. You know, I'm going to I'm going to support the church. I'm going to tithe and give sacrificially and get, you know, give to give to what I believe God's doing and I want to be part of that. I mean, if you tell other people they're going to go, that's dumb. That's foolish. I mean, it's not it's not crazy. It's just well, it might be to them, right? But it's, but it, it, it's really not. It's just, it's sacrificial. They would never do it. It doesn't make sense to them, but you've bought into something different. You, you believe that God's at, at work in the world and that there's an eternity and, and there's, there's eternity at stake that people are, are one decision away from changing their eternal destiny. And when you look at life like that and when you look at people that way, it's going to change how you take risks with your finances, with your time, with with how you serve. You know, it's risk-taking to serve because our tendency is to want to serve ourselves. It's about making sure I'm doing okay. And, uh, and when we serve, when we choose to serve, whether it's on serve day or any day during the week of any, of all, of throughout the year, you're, it's, that's a risk. You're saying, I'm, I'm sowing into, I believe God sees this. I believe I'm making a difference in this person's life. And we take a Christ-like risk. Okay, lastly, Use your brain. God gave you a brain. He wants you to use it. He doesn't want you to put it on a shelf. You don't go into neutral. Oh, I'm a Christian now. and My brain goes into neutral. No. God says, remember Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your soul. Hey, all your mind. All your mind. God gave you a brain and you use it. And certainly Joseph does that. But when he heard that Archelaus, that's Herod's, one of his sons, was reigning in Judea in place of his father, Herod. He was afraid to go there. Now, because Archelaus wasn't a whole lot better than his dad. He also was a thug. He was also a tyrant. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and he lived in a town called Nazareth. So he goes to this little teeny town that nobody's heard of. He was planning on going back to Bethlehem. That's where his hometown was. And he thinks, well, that's not good. That's dangerous because of Archelaus. And so he thinks through, he goes, well, where can I go? Well, if I go up to Galilee, Mary would have a network of support. That's her hometown. It's little, but with Herod dying, uh, there's a town right four miles away from, from, see, Nazareth was really small, a very poor little rural community. They, They actually lived mostly in caves. I've been there a few times, and it's ancient Nazareth is just these little caves. And people who lived in caves were very, very poor in that day, just like they would be today, but certainly in that day. And so they usually got their, their, their employment from Sepphoris, which is a bigger town four miles away. But Sepphoris was in particular uh, 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 need of employment because Herod, uh, right, right when he was dying and right after his death, Herod the Great had wiped Sepphoris out. And so they were rebuilding. So there's a lot of work to do a lot of carpentry that was needed. And Joseph was a carpenter. And we know Jesus was. That's because he learned it from, from Joseph. Joseph was a carpenter. So he could go and he could provide for his family. Mary could get emotional and relational support in her hometown. And it was off the grid. It was so small, nobody knew 
anything about Nazareth. It's, it's almost non-existent in any of the literature that, of the historians of that day. I mean, it just was, and so it kind of kept him off the map. How did he come up with all of that? He used his brain. Right? He used his brain. Hey, this, w- this makes a lot of sense. This is, this, this is, this is part of... The w- God gives us free will. We get to choose. So when we're following God, God speaks to us. We use his word. We use our, we use, we use our brain, right? That's a big part of it. So then anyone who hears these words of mine and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So we want to build our lives on what God has for us. Okay, lastly, I want to read from this verse here. Paul, he tried to, you know, he's the writer of a lot of the New Testament. He tried to obey God. He tried to follow God tried to love God with all his heart, all his mind, all his strength, all his soul. And, you know, and, but sometimes when things don't make sense, it gets hard. It gets hard. And here's what Paul says. He says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed and broken. How is that possible? How can you not be crushed when you're pressed? He says, we are perplexed because why? We don't know why things happen as they do, but we don't give up and quit. Now, that's a word for some of you. Some of you are in a place where you're being crushed, you're perplexed. You don't know why. And listen, it's hard enough to follow God when you do know why. But when you don't know why, and things are happening that are unscheduled, unplanned, that are throwing you out of your comfort zone, causing you to be enveloped with fear, big and small, it gets just tough. And so he says, you don't give up. You don't give up. And we, we go to God. We need the support of one another. And we just say, God, fill me up again. And that's my prayer for you. Some of you need that. Some of you need to go to God and say, God, that's where I'm at. That describes me. That's my situation. I mean, I don't have to put myself in Joseph's shoes. Those are my shoes. And my encouragement for you is just take that to God. Let the Holy Spirit work in your life. Change your attitude, maybe even change your circumstances. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. If you would, I just would ask everybody to just bow your heads, close your eyes in this moment of, of, of just going before God. Because in our own strength, we can't get anything done that means anything. It's ultimately, we've got we've to go to the source, which is, which is our God who loves us. And would you just begin and say, God, I want to I learn to love you. Help me to, what I do out of my life, be an outgrowth of a loving relationship. Would you say, God, teach me what it means to obey? In the best sense of that word, with love, with trust. You say, God, some of you, God's calling you to, his word for you is to do it now. You know what to do. And you've been procrastinating and he's saying, do it now. This is your moment. Don't don't wait to the end of the year. Some of you don't even need to wait to the end of the day. God's calling some of you to stay in in the race. Keep on trusting him. You can do it. Some of you need to leave something behind. Let it go. It's keeping you from God's best. And even as I say that, it's propping up. You're thinking, yeah, that's, it might be a habit. It might be a relationship. It might be a behavior. God's saying, let that go. And some of you need to take a risk. Say, God, I'm, I'm ready. I, I know you will help me. You'll guide me. I want you to use your brain. If you've never put your faith in Christ, then I'm going to invite you to do that right now. Right now. Or maybe it's been a long time. The truth is you're here and you know you're, that you know that's, you're not close to God. You're not, you're not where you need to be. And you don't want to go into this new year, this new decade, just redoing the same stuff, trying the same things you've done in the past. And if that's you, I'm going to invite you to pray with me right here, right now. 
And I'm going to ask you to let me know that you're, that you're saying, Andy, I'm going I'm to follow along with you. I'm going to lead you in prayer. And I want you to let me know by just lifting your hand up. Okay, you can just do that right where you're at right now. It doesn't mean you're going to bless you. It doesn't mean you're joining the church. or, or any, It just means you're saying, count me in on that prayer. I see you in the back. Say, I'm ready. I'm ready to come home. Anybody else? Yep, over here on the side. I see, yep, in the front. Anybody else? Say, this is, this is my season. This is my moment. Okay, right there. Yep, I see you right there. Okay, you can put your hand down. Go to God with me, okay? Pray this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, give me what it takes something beyond myself. You say, God, give me what it takes to follow you. I invite your Holy Spirit to come into my life. And then would you say, Holy Spirit, help me to respond quickly. Holy Spirit, help me to respond faithfully. Holy Spirit, help me to let let it go. And then name that thing that's in your mind. By your power, I know I've tried it on my own, but help me to let it go once and for all. Would you say, Holy Spirit, help me to take risks. Christ-like risks. Holy Spirit, help me to use my brain. You see, I, give me a fresh start In Jesus' name, amen.